So this church doorway that you see behind me at Boxter Church has been standing here more or less as you see it today for a number of centuries, since at least the early 17th century. It hasn't really changed much at all in that time. And if you move up and down the country and visit parish churches, you will see a number of per, uh, church porches just like this. Uh, they're used up and down the country. They're a very familiar sight. However, if you approach the church doorway like this in the little village of Orton, which is a tiny hamlet about 15 miles south of York in Yorkshire, if you approach that church through its doorway, you will notice something very unusual. On the left-hand side, just as you go in, there's a small lizard engraved into the stonework of the church building itself. That lizard was the emblem of the local Ask family, a very uh, well-known family in the local area who became absolutely central to one of the most important events of Henry VIII's reigns. In fact, one of the most serious crises that he faced. They became prominent leaders of the Pilgrimage of Grace, a massive uprising against Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell's campaign of reformation of the English church. So who was Robert Ask and why was he so important to the Pilgrimage of Grace? Well, Robert Ask was the son of the Ask family from Yorkshire. However, he'd moved down to London and had trained as a lawyer. So we're talking about a family with kind of middle class connections. They're educated, they've got some money and some wealth and some reputation in the local area, and they understand the workings of the law and of the political system. So they're an important family in terms of the social hierarchy, but they're not rich or noblemen by any stretch of the imagination. But Robert Ask, the trained London lawyer, rose to prominence when the people of the north of England turned to him with his skills and his experience and his understanding of politics to lead them in a rebellion against Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell's changes to the Catholic Church. So why were the people of the north of England specifically so angry with Henry's changes to the church? Why did we see a rising in the end of 30,000, 50,000 people in the north which we didn't see in London or in other parts of the South. Why was this a Northern Rising? Well, the answer is fairly simple. Of course, one of the key reasons that people were so unhappy in the North of England in the 1530s was the dissolution of the monasteries. Henry and Thomas Cromwell had begun with the dissolution of the lesser monasteries in 1536 and uh, eventually would end up dissolving all of the monasteries in 1539. And the reason why people in the north of England were so unhappy about this is the reason that lots of people were unhappy across the country. Because for centuries, the monasteries, the convents, the Catholic Church had provided sites of sanctuary for people. The monasteries and so on were places where you went to find sustenance if you were poor and starving. They perhaps would help you to eat. But as you will know from your study of medicine, these were also the places where you would go for medical treatments. The people there would care for you if you were sick uh, and they would help you if you were hungry, as well as providing the spiritual guidance for you to get to heaven. So by dissolving the monasteries, you weren't only getting rid of people's opportunities for salvation and to find God and to go to heaven, which is very important in those days. You're also hurting people in a practical sense by withdrawing any opportunity they have for financial help or for medical help. These are very important places, the monasteries, and by closing them down, you were really affecting people's everyday life. And we can break down the rebels who took part in the Pilgrimage of Grace into their different social groups because different people revolted against Henry VIII for slightly different reasons. Let's take the gentry. These are the middle classes, people with some money, some education, and perhaps they own some land. These people were very unhappy because as educated people who were devout Catholics, they were absolutely horrified by the changes taking place uh, in the Catholic Church. They were horrified by uh, the Act of the Ten Articles, for instance, which really frustrated and angered many Catholics in the North. They saw this as a step too far in reforming the Catholic Church and its theology. Uh, this was not a popular move, move in the North, and people were fearsomely protective of their religion. But what about the ordinary people themselves, lower down the social order? Well, they also joined the Pilgrimage of Grace, and so we see in the Pilgrimage of Grace people of all different walks of life coming together. Noblemen as devout Catholics, the middle class and the gentry as devout Catholics, protecting their religion, but also ordinary peasant people, ordinary poor people. Uh, they are joining it also for religious reasons, to protect the Catholic Church and its sacraments, uh, its rituals and so on, to protect their souls but also because of more straightforward reasons. In the 1530s, there'd been a number of poor harvests, and you can see behind me here this lovely field of corn. Well, at the time, 
this sort of thing would have been a rare sight. We're used to this today, but in the 1530s to till land like this took a lot of man hours, a lot of labor, and it wasn't always guaranteed that it would grow and that people would eat. Bad weather uh, and so on could affect the way crops growed. And over a number of years, there had been poor harvests. People were poor and they were hungry. These changes to the Catholic Church and to the monasteries, the dissolution of the monasteries, meant that people in the north of England were not accessing the aid and the help that the church used to provide. When they saw that their money was not going to the church and it was going to Henry instead, money that they needed to eat, this angered them even further. So changes to the church, changes to the way they worship, and the economic impact and the poor harvests made people very unhappy and very angry. This is a perfect storm of ingredients that you would need to rise people up to take action against their king. You can also add on top of this the hatred of individuals, not just economic or religious factors, but individuals. People in the north of England, the poor, the middle classes, the rich, equally alike, all had a hatred for Thomas Cromwell and for Anne Boleyn. And why? Well, because though both of them were Protestants. It was a you know, very badly hidden fact that they were Protestants and that they were trying to Protestantize the country. So the feelings towards Anne Boleyn, the king's wife, and the feelings towards Thomas Cromwell, his chief minister, were running very high in the north of England. So what actually happened during the Pilgrimage of Grace? Well, Robert Ask led a group of around about 9,000 people at first in the north of England to the city of York. When they entered the city of York, they began making changes to the churches there, reinstating the Catholic features that had been removed by Thomas Cromwell and the religious changes of Henry VIII. They took over and occupied the city of York and they weren't really stopped because the people of York themselves supported the uprising. Uh, they might not necessarily have got involved, but they weren't going to stop it. They were too were Catholics, and they supported this uprising against Thomas Cromwell and the King. And from New York, with the first 9,000 revolters, the uprising grew. People heard about it from other towns, other villages, and they flocked to join the Pilgrimage of Grace. Eventually, the numbers grew to around about 30,000, and 30,000 of these people eventually marched south and they were uh, finally met at the city of Doncaster, although at the time it wasn't a city, it was a very small town. 30,000 protesters descended on this town in October 1536, and there they were met by who, of course? Yes, the Duke of Norfolk. He came there to meet the rebels and to try and crush the uprising. In the end, the Duke of Norfolk made a series of promises to the rebels of the Pilgrimage of Grace. And if you know anything about the history, and maybe if you think back to something like the Peasants' Revolt, what we know often about these promises that are made by kings and their messengers is that they're not really worth anything at all. Unfortunately, Robert Ask, who'd led these rebels, took the Duke of Norfolk's word for it and disbanded the Pilgrimage of Grace, disbanded the uprising and went home. They accepted the Duke of Norfolk's offers. But the Duke of Norfolk didn't have the authority to make any of these offers. He couldn't possibly keep any of the offers that he made, offers to reinstate certain religious changes, to reverse them and so on. He couldn't keep these promises. There's no way that the king is going to allow it. So, of course, the rebels are eventually frustrated in their demands. They go home, hopeful that there's going to be some changes, but there are none. However, there are some outcomes. Of course, Henry's not going to let this pass without a few executions. And there was a number but not as many as you might think. Only around 216 people were executed by uh, the Tudor government after the Pilgrimage of Grace. But most surprisingly, this includes, of course, six abbots. These are very high-ranking people in the Catholic Church in England. 38 monks, 16 priests, and a whole range of different knights, uh, local esquires, gentry, and lords are all executed. People from every walk of life and even from the clergy, from the church, are executed for their part in this. Robert Ask himself was hung from chains in the city of York and he was left to starve to death and as his body rotted away even while he was still alive it is said that the crows were pecking at his flesh and eating him while he still lived. So he suffered a pretty nasty fate for trying to turn against Henry VIII. Of course, was the Pilgrimage of Grace successful? Well, on the whole, no, not really much was achieved. They tried to stop the dissolution of the monasteries. This entire uh, uprising was to put a halt to Cromwell's dissolution of the monasteries. It failed in that regard. That continued. 
they failed to reverse the religious changes, the Protestantization of the church, if you like. That continued as well. But there were some small advances. Certain changes that had taken place, like the Ten Articles, were revised. And this is why the king introduced the Act of the Six Articles to kind of put a few Catholic things back into the church. So some small changes were won, but in terms of the amount of people killed and the size of the uprising, really we have to think of this as a massive failure, or if you like, a massive success for the king in crushing it. So that's the Pilgrimage of Grace, an attempt to stop Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell's changes to the Catholic Church, and also to stop the dissolution of the monasteries in the north of England.